Hey, everybody, Michael Batiste. Hey, Michael Batiste from the Elk Calling Academy. Welcome back to Wapiti Wednesday Q&A. So um, tonight's discussion, I was originally going to call this, um, you know, mistakes beginners make when elk hunting. But uh, the more I thought about it, a lot of these mistakes are made by experienced hunters too. So that's why tonight is basically mistakes that are made while elk hunting and how to avoid them. So I, I will apologize, guys. I, I may cough a little bit, um, just kind of getting over a little bit of uh, bronchitis here. So, so anyways, let's, let's jump into it. So, you know, some of the mistakes that I see made or I hear made, um, really are critical. Um, and in fact, on our Facebook page, I, I posted that uh, this was tonight's discussion and said, hey, what kind of mistakes have you guys seen? And got some really good responses. Um, you know, one guy basically said that uh, last year, opening weekend, got about 75 yards away from a bull. Uh, the bull was bugling at some cows and, and he immediately through a challenge bugle and that cow just, sh or, or that bull just shut up, gathered up his cows and ran the other way. And, and I hear this a lot. Um, it's being aggressive on the calls when the bull that you're working is really not in that aggressive mindset, or you, you've started with kind of a passive calling approach and then jumped right into, um, you know, that, uh, that aggressiveness. And so really it's, you, you find the bull in the right mindset, it's going to be okay. But, but a lot of times, you know, prime example right there, this bull was not in that mindset. So really it's, it's understanding elk vocalizations, their behaviors and, you know, tailoring your calling approach to kind of what you're dealing with. And so that's, that's one of the big, big mistakes that, that I see, you know, made, made there, you know, we've all heard the saying, you can't fit a square peg into a round hole. So, well, I guess if you beat on it enough times with a hammer, you can make it fit, but um, so definitely if you're calling to the situation. Oh, um, you know, in fact, I, I had a student tonight and we kind of talked about that. I, I kind of told him, you know, I asked him where he was at. It was a first lesson. And, uh, he, he said, people have told him that he sounds good. And my immediate question was, do they ask you to call for them? And he goes, no, they never have. And I said, okay, I'm not, not trying to be harsh, but you know, our friends and our families, sometimes aren't the best to get information from, especially when we're learning calling or we're working on things because they don't want to be mean to us. They don't want to be negative. So, you know, you do some sounds and you're like, Hey, how does that sound? And they're like, Oh, that sounds great. And then you get out there and you sound like nothing close to an elk. Here's the deal with YouTube right here, guys, you have great access to a lot of bulls that are bugling. OK, we all have cell phones. You can record on the cell phone. Here's a great tip on your computer. Pull up some bull bugle videos that you want to practice to set your phone by the computer. Get that ready to record. Hit record on your phone. Play the sound on the video of the bull bugling and then you bugle and then stop the recording and listen to it. How close to that bull do you sound? You can do this with cow sounds, you can do this with bugles, but really, do you wanna kind of match another person calling or do you wanna match and sound like the real thing? So why not practice on the real thing and mimicking the real thing, but making sure that you record it so that you can hear the real bull and you can hear you, know, you bugling also. I think another mistake that a lot of people make, and this is this is primarily talking to uh, people coming from, you know, the eastern side of the U.S. to come out and hunt elk. I really don't think they understand how. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. I don't think they really understand how steep and rugged the country is that, that elk live in. Um, you know, it's 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 one thing to you know, run 10 miles at a thousand feet, but it's completely different to hike four miles at 9,500 or 10,000 feet. It really does affect your body. 
Um, the other thing that kind of couples with that, you know, I, I know as the popularity of backcountry hunting continues to grow, um, I've run into people in the backcountry that had no business being back in there. Um, you know, they basically had it stuck in their head. We've looked at the map. We're going six miles, seven miles back in, but then they get out here and realize this country is so rugged and so up and down and steep, but they don't have a backup plan. Basically, you know, dang it, we're, we're committed to going seven miles in. Well, they made it seven miles in. There's four of them for seven days and they're going to go seven miles in and put four bulls on the ground and get four bulls seven miles back out. When in reality, they get one or two bulls down, it's going to take the rest of their time to get all that elk out. So, so kind of, I guess what I'm really saying is false expectations. So, Really, you know, the way you kind of avoid this is is when you're looking, and this is this is even for guys that live out west that are going to another state to hunt. Um, you know, study those maps. Don't just have an A plan. You know, your game plan. You need to have an A, B, C, D, E. Because once you really get to that area, you may find out that <clears throat> it's not what you thought it was going to be. And the hard part is is uh, you know, we only have limited time to hunt. And so we get to that area, we throw our pack in, we go five, six, seven miles deep. Well, it might take two, three days to really figure out that, dang it, this area isn't that good, or maybe a couple of days, and then you have to come back out. And so out of a seven day hunt, well, you, you know, you've, you've kind of lost four days there. So, and now to move and locate and this and that. So really do, do your due diligence when you're heading out of state study the maps, uh, you know, pick up the phone, call fish and game, get on the phone with biologists, talk about areas, get on the phone with, you know, what's the trail system like? What's the timber like? Is there blowdowns? What, what, what am I going to kind of experience? What's the water like? Get all this information and be as prepared as you can um, to come out. So, all right, next mistake. This is something that I'm actually guilty of sometimes. So, you know, uh, we've hunted for a few days, we've covered a lot of miles and, you know, we decided, okay, we're going to, we're going to put in this big loop. We're going to put in a 15 mile loop day and you're all excited in the morning. You start doing your loop and, and as you go on this loop and gain elevation, you're not hearing any bugles. You're not seeing much fresh sign. You're kind of, kind of going. And as the day progresses, you stop hunting and Basically, you're just hiking at that point. You're not really paying attention to your surroundings. You're not really hunting anymore. Like I said, you're just hiking. And then all of a sudden, you drop down into a little draw and you bump right into a whole herd of elk and you blow that elk out because you weren't hunting, you weren't paying attention. Well, depending on the time of day, this may have been their bedding area that you just tromped right through and blew them out of there's a chance that group may not be back in that area for three, four five days, or if at all during that season. So it's, it's pretty easy to do to kind of get in that dull mind, get out of the hunting mode and just get into the hiking mode. So that's where, you know, a partner is kind of nice to help keep each other, you know, in the game. I know a lot of guys really like to solo hunt. Um, and that's great. And the mental, aspect of it is really, really tough on solo hunting, especially if you've been putting in the miles day after day after day, not seeing much, not hearing much. We, we, we kind of fall into kind of that, uh, um, hiking mode. So, um, mental, mental toughness and the mental game is, is, is pretty critical. And like I said, it's a mistake that I've done. In fact, I made it, um, very early in the season last year. So, um, it, it, it happens. So, all right. Another thing, camping where the elk live. So, um, prime example, a couple of years ago, we were up hunting an area and we were, we were heading up the road to, to go to a trailhead to hike in and, and we come around the corner and we hadn't been up there yet this year. And here's this cab over 
camper in a pickup camped right on this road right here. And there was a couple of people out there. And so we kind of stopped and talked to them. And, and it was funny because they, they said, man, we don't understand it. We came up here this summer and, you know, we've scouted all summer long and man, this road used to be littered with elk tracks. And, and our first day here, the elk were all over the place right in here. And, and now they're just nowhere. Well, yeah, that's because you're camping where the elk are living. So, um, you know, it's it's always nice to try to get as close as we can to where they're at to set up camp, especially or this or that. But if you camp where the elk live, they're going to end up changing their pattern. They're going to end up changing their routine. They're going to leave that area. So, you know, go ahead and camp a uh, half mile down the road, mile down the road or whatever. It's not that big a deal to drive a mile or two up there in the morning to that trailhead or to that area or whatever. Um, if, if you're, you know, in the back country, um, you know, maybe drop over the backside. It depends on the terrain, what their, what their route is. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors that go into that of what's too close. Biggest thing is camp far enough away that no matter which way the thermals go, your scent is not going to affect the elk. So, um, okay. Another, another big mistake is over calling. There's, there's a fine line between calling too much and not calling enough. Um, this is kind of a, a double, double deal here on mistakes. So the over calling thing, you know, we've talked about it before. You're out there on a pretty quiet day in the forest. Nothing is really making any sounds. And, and all of a sudden you just start ripping all these sounds, all these cow sounds, all these bugles. It's not realistic. That's, that's not what the surrounding is telling you. That's not what the rest of the forest around you is doing. So, you know, match your surroundings. The other thing that kind of couples with this is I've seen, um, individuals that are new to elk hunting that they get engaged with a bull, they get set up, they start working and they want to force the situation. They think, man, if I call more, he's going to come faster or I can persuade his mind quicker. And, and just the opposite can happen. You can actually get him to where he loses interest and goes away because again, it's not realistic. So best thing to do is match the pace of the bull that you're calling to. So if he's bugling quite a bit, you bugle quite a bit. If he's bugling only once every few minutes, then you really need to taper your calling back to where you do a sequence and then you might wait two, three minutes before you do another sequence. But match the pace of the bull that you're calling to and kind of avoid that over calling. On the flip side, not calling enough can be the same thing. You don't want to do just one or two sounds and then you wait 20 minutes before you do one or two sounds again and then 20 minutes because that's not really realistic either so it's kind of that fine line of of calling too much not calling enough so um not being aggressive enough this one i see a bunch which you know you're engaged in a bull he's flat out aggressive he's screaming and you're like, well, I'm just going to do a little spike squeal or, um, you know, I don't want to sound too big because I don't want to run him off. Bull crap. If you don't sound large enough, he's not going to waste his time. You know, he's, he's spending a lot of energy as it is keeping in track of his cows and breeding. It, it, if he thinks that you're not a match or you're even a threat to him, he's not going to give you the time of day. He's not really going to worry about you. So, Again, where we talked about matching the pace of the bull you're calling to, well, this one here, we're going to match the intensity of the bull that we're calling to. So, um, you know, you match it or go slightly above it, but you never want to back down and, and you get to that timid or, you know, small bull phase where you're afraid you're going to blow them out. You're, you're not going to. Um you know, thinking it was a hunter, 
when in reality it was a bull. It can be tough sometimes, you know, and we've talked about this on a past episode of how to tell the difference between a hunter and a bull. Sometimes it's tough. Um, you know, sometimes you have to start working that way and get close enough to where you can hear that bottom end of the bull and, and really, you know, decide, okay, yeah, that, that is a bull. Once you get close enough, you'll hear a bottom end that bulls have that we have a hard time replicating as, as, as humans. Um, but don't just assume that it's a person or it's a bull. Now, granted, there, there are calls on the market that as soon as you hear, you flat out know human. Um, but, you know, don't just jump to a conclusion. You know, try to, try to hear a couple of bugles, two or three bugles. Try to move a little bit closer. Um, I mean, what's, what's the big deal if you kind of work that way, you know, 100, 200 yards? Okay, yep, that is a person. I'm just going to roll up over the ridge and drop into this next basin or whatever. So, all right, guys, there's just a few examples of some of the mistakes and, and kind of how to avoid them. I just wanted to kind of touch on some that uh, people had brought up. Um, if you guys haven't submitted questions down below this video, feel free to throw those into the comment sections and we'll, we'll answer them on upcoming episodes of Wapiti Wednesday Q&A. Uh, this Friday's video coming, we are doing a full review of the bendable products lineup of reed pouches and reed holders. So kind of give you some good ideas to uh, store your reeds while you're out in, out in the field hunting. So, all right, guys, thanks for tuning in tonight. I'm going to kind of cut this short. I'm getting really, really dry from doing a couple of lessons and talking. So as always, guys, appreciate you tuning in. As always, keep calling, keep practicing, but most importantly, have fun. And we'll see you next week on the next episode of Wapiti Wednesday Q&A brought to you by Elk Calling Academy. Have a great night, guys. Ha <laughs> ha!